This is the Tom Bigby Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. I write about a small town in northeast Mississippi on the Tom Bigby River called Columbus. And sometimes I write about the rest of the state. This episode is titled The USS Cyclops Lost in the Bermuda Triangle. George W. Barrow was born in 1900 in Columbus, Mississippi, and he enlisted in Jackson, Mississippi in the U.S. Navy for World War I. George began as a 17-year-old apprentice seaman in Norfolk, Virginia. He was then sent to the Naval Training Station in Charleston and became a seaman second class on December 12, 1917. He was sent back to Norfolk, Virginia and assigned to the USS Cyclops. The Cyclops took coal to Brazil to refuel British anti-sub ships. They departed from uh, Norfolk on January 8, 1918, and then once arriving in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, they spent two weeks um, unloading and reloading their ship with manganese for the return trip home. They arrived in Barbados on March 3rd and departed again on March 4th of 1918 to return to Norfolk. Their last transmission as they entered the Bermuda Triangle was weather well, all fair. Nothing was ever found of the 309 souls lost. Not a bobbing cork-based life preserver. Not any pieces off the ship. Nothing. It was considered the largest non-combat loss of life in U.S. naval history. A cenotaph is in Friendship Cemetery to commemorate George Barrow in his family's plot. Now, why? what exactly did happen, and how did his family find out? Well, part of the problem is apparently um, the, sh- the, the uh, crewman did not have a lot of experience with... Um, with manganese, which is what they were being loaded down with. And uh, it was an 11,000 ton order of this ore. And the manganese was really critical for the U.S. war. And yet they were totally inexperienced as a crew on how to handle it. Uh, And later port officials would say that the ship had been overloaded and with her normal waterline mark, well below the surface. Uh, I'll add to that, the Cyclops had had cracked the cylinder head in its starboard engine, reducing her to one engine only when they were coming into um, port. And so they had dropped their speed to just 10 knots. The captain, John Worley, um, had set out on February the 22nd for a direct trip to Baltimore Harbor in the Chesapeake Bay, intending to have that engine repaired when he got back from Brazil. Instead, they made an unscheduled side trip to Barbados, arriving on March 3rd. While there, Worley had to go into the U.S. Embassy, and he visited with the American ambassador, Brock Holst Livingston, and there they took on more coal and a supply of water, adding to their already greatly overloaded ship. Uh, And it's possible he actually was trying to find somebody to fix the broken engine there. In any case, they left Barbados the next day, heavily overloaded and limping along on just that one engine. And they were never seen again. When they were reported overdue at Baltimore, the Navy sent out a search looking for them up and down the East Coast, but they couldn't find any trace of the ship or her crew. And so it still remains the largest non-combat loss of life in U.S. naval history. Now, what are some of the theories of what had happened? Well, it could have been ambushed by a U-boat and torpedoed. Um, there, Though there are no records from the Germans showing the U-boats were operating in that area at that time. Another theory is that the ship's captain, Worley, who was uh, born in Germany, his name was originally Johann Friedrich Weichmann, 
had entered the U.S. illegally. Uh, he d- jumped a German freighter in San Francisco Harbor in 1878. So he'd been in the U.S. a long time. Um, but Livingston said uh, that the, the ambassador to and Barbados said that uh, Worsley was not very well liked by uh, the ship's crew. And, and that even though lots of people on the crew had Germanic names, it was still an anti-German time. There was a lot of propaganda and perhaps the crew mutinied and deliberately took over the ship and turned it over to the German Navy. But there's no records that show anything like that. Another theory is that the manganese ore that they carried, uh, which was highly explosive, uh, could have produced a fire that engulfed the ship and it sank. Um, but the even more importantly, perhaps the inexperience of the crew and the, resulted in that misloading of that shipment and it could have shifted during the trip um, due to storms and high seas and just unexpectedly rolled over and capsized. Now that theory is actually fairly strong as there was a severe storm that moved in on the Virginia coast March 9th and 10th and perhaps the ship was lost at sea. Uh, so the theory that this uh, has happened is pretty strong because another freighter, the SS Amolco, had reported passing a ship off the coast of Virginia on March 9th. That probably could have been the Cyclops because uh, uh, it, it, the type of ship it was. Anyways, in the 1960s, some U.S. divers were searching about 40 nautical miles northeast of Cape Charles at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. And they were a salvage operation. Um, and they were looking for a missing nuclear sub called the USS Scorpion, which was found later sunken near the Azores. They were in the wrong area looking. Regardless, when Dean Hawes, the Navy diver, was... Uh, at the bottom, uh, at about 180 feet deep, he saw a ship, uh, another shipwreck that he was not familiar with the shape of the ship. And it was a very odd uh, structure with iron beams and lots of cargo arms. And when he later was shown a picture of the USS Cyclops, he said it that the Collier's design was something that he had seen on the ship that he saw at the bottom of the sea. Um, The Navy went back trying to find it, and unfortunately, they were never able to relocate the, um, where uh, the Cyclops or the ship that this man saw could possibly have been. Um, We don't know exactly what happened uh, to the Cyclops. We just know that She went down with 309 souls on board, one of which was Columbus native George W. Barrow, never to be seen again. I want to thank you for coming on my podcast, The Tom Bigby Tales. Until next time.